Hello, welcome to Miss Rose's story time. It's been almost a year since I have um, videoed story time. I was reading Carry On Mr. Bodwich. Um, however, it's been about exactly a year since then and I'm not able to find it. So, I'm asking if it's alright if y'all just um, give me a clean slate and we start again um, fresh and new for this new 2019. I have a um, different device to be able to record and um, a better internet and things in the country here where I live. So um, I'll be able to be more consistent and I apologize for my lack of consistency in the past and I hope to um, go forward with this um, upgraded technology that I have now to be able to be consistent and fluent for story time. This evening's story time is The Bronze Bow by Elizabeth George Spear. And today's story is dedicated to Solomon Fru in Twin City, Georgia. And, um, <laughs> and I, um, we're going to begin with chapter one, The Bronze Bow. A boy stood on the path of the mountain overlooking the sea. He was a tall boy with little trace of youth in his lean, hard body. At 18, Daniel Bar Jamin was unmistakably a Galilean. With the bold features of his countrymen, the sun brown skin, and the brilliant dark eyes that could light the fierce patriotism and blackened with swift anger. A proud race, the Galileans, violent and restless unreconciled that Palestine was a conquered nation, refusing to acknowledge and their lord, the emperor Tiberius, in far-off Rome. Looking down into the valley, the boy could see the silver-gray traces, terraces of olive, traces of olive trees splashed with bergen thickets of Olander. He remembered that in the brown mud roof town, every clump of earth, every cranny in a stone wall could have burst into springtime flower. Remembering, he scowled up against the hot noonday sun. He was waiting for two figures to Reaper among the boulders and tumbled on either side of the path just above him. He was puzzled and uneasy at odds with himself. Who were these two who had been so foolhardly as to climb the mountain? He was restful that they resentful, he was resentful that they had reminded him of the village, fearful that they might look back and discover him. Yet unwilling to let them out of his sight, why was he so bent on following them? When all he had wanted for five years was to forget that other world in the valley, he glimpsed the boy again, some distance up, then the girl. Some memory nagged at him. Brother and sister? That was evident. They moved alike, with sort of a free-swinging ease. They had the same high cheekbones and dark, ruddy complexions. Their voices were sharp in the clean air. Daniel could see the girl clearly. She had stopped to snatch a cluster of pink flax blossoms, and she stood now, poised on a rock, her face lifted, her yellow head covering slipped back off her dark hair. Look, Joel, she cried, her voice coming down to him distinct distinctly. How blue the lake is. You can see the church's palace in Tiberias. 
Daniel's black brows drew together fiercely. Now he recognized the boy. He was Joel Bar Hezron, the red-cheeked boy who used to come to the synagogue school, the scribe's son, the one the rabbi held up for an example, the one they used to tease because of his twin sister always waited outside to walk home with him. She had an odd name, Malthus. Five years ago, that was, and Daniel could still feel hurt of seeing her waiting there outside the school while his own sister, we're almost there, the boy's voice rang out. The girl sprang down from the rock. The two flicked out of the sight, sending a quick hail of pebbles bouncing down the path. Daniel moved forward with the caution of an animal stalking its prey. He reached the top just as the girl flushed and out of breath, flung herself down on the patch of grass where Joel waited. She snatched the head covering clear off, letting the wind pull at her hair. Daniel could see them pointing out to each other the landmarks below. From where he crouched, he could not see the valley, but he knew the sight of it well enough. How many times had he sat where those two sat now, looking down at that village of Kedza that had been his home? Not so often these last years, but at first, before he had got used to life in the, in the cave. Sometimes he had climbed up and sat here till dark, straining his eyes to catch the specks of light, picturing Leah and his grandmother at their evening meal, wondering if he would ever see them again. He never had, and he had stopped remembering and wondering until today. Now that Joel and his sister were no longer shouting, the wind hid their voices. He stared at them, disappointed and baffled. He had to hear them. More than that, he was fighting back a longing to speak with them, his own people after five years. He looked down at his bare, calloused feet, at the goat-skin tunic bound with a thong around his waist. What would they think of him? Those two in their clean robes and leather sandals. Suppose he should risk his freedom for nothing? But he could not help himself. Like an animal lured out of hiding, he edged slowly from behind the rock. Instantly, the boy was on his feet. The girl swiftly up be beside him. He might have known they would be off at the sight of him. To his astonishment, they stood still. He saw Joel's hands clenched. The boy was now coward. No coward. The boy was no coward. Daniel stood on the trail, his heart pounding. If they ran from him now, he could not bear it. He fumbled for the remembered greeting. Peace be with you, he said. Joel did not relax his guard. Peace, he said shortly. Then, what do you want? No harm, Joel Berzon, said Daniel. How do you know me? I heard your sister call you. I am Daniel Barjan. Joel stared, remembered suddenly living his face. The parent, the parent, princess who ran away from the blacksmith, Daniel scowled. No one blamed you, said Joel quickly. Everyone knows how Amalek treats his boys. I care nothing for Amalek, Daniel said. Can you tell me about my grandmother and my sister? Joel frowned, shook his head. I'm afraid I can't. Do you know them, Vince? The girl had been frightened and her breath was still uneven. But she spoke with a frankness like Joel's. There's an old woman who comes to the well in mourning. 
she said. She lives in the house behind the street of the cheesemakers. Yes, Daniel said hungrily. The girl hesitated. They say she has a little girl who never goes out of the house. Still, he had thought perhaps in all this time that my sister Leah, he said, he wished he had not asked. It's better, been better not knowing. No one has ever seen her, the girl went on, but I know that she's there. I'm sorry. I wish I could tell you more. Daniel hesitated, embarrassed, but unwilling to give up. There was a boy named Simon, he said, six or seven years older. He was bound to Emlek too. You must mean Simon the Zealot. Zealot, said Joel. You know him? I've heard of him. He has his own shop now. They say he gets more business than Emelec. He used to help me, said Daniel. He has a reputation for being a good man and a good patriot. Would you give him a message for me? Would you tell him I'm up here? I like him to know. Joe looked surprised. You mean you live up here? Yes. Alone? Is it safe? I mean, they say the mountain is full of robbers. Daniel said nothing. Are you lonely? I don't live alone, said Daniel. Oh, Joel was baffled. Don't you ever come down to the village? I just get dragged back to Amalek's shop. I suppose so. Yes, I'll tell Simon, of course. How long since you ran away? Five years about. Simon will remember me, though. The girl spoke in a straightforward voice that matched the look in her eyes. Five years? Do you mean your grandmother hasn't known where you were in all this time? Daniel looked at the ground, his lips tightening. Tomorrow when she comes to the well, can I tell her I've seen you? Daniel looked back at his, at her with resentment. He had long since managed to quiet his conscience, and he did not like having it stirred up again. If you like, he said. He felt angry at himself now and disappointed. Why had he given himself away after all these years? What had he expected? There was nothing more to stay for. You'd better go back, he said, turning away. You shouldn't have come up here. Why not? asked Joel, looking not at all alarmed. I'm warning you. After this, stay in the village. He walked away from them. Wait, called Joel. Joel, he looked at his sister with a swift question, and she nodded. We... We brought our lunch. Will you eat with us? The blood rushed up into Daniel's face. He had not asked for their charity. It's not much, Joel said, but we'd like to talk to you some more. Was it possible this boy had made the offer in friendship? Slowly, like a wary animal, Daniel took a few steps back and let him down on the grass, let himself down on the grass. From the po pocket of the wide striped griddle that bound her waist, girdle that bound her waist, the girl pulled a neatly wrapped bundle. Joel pounced a small flask, which produced a small flask, which with his handed, to, which he handed to his sister, then sat down and solemnly held out his hands. With astonishment, Daniel watched the girl pour a little stream of water over her brother's hands. Hand washing before a meal, he hadn't given a thought to for five years. He wouldn't have imagined that even a scribe's son would carry water all the way up the mountain just to observe the law. Then the girl turned towards him. 
He saw the question in her eyes and a slight shrinking and a stubborn pride stiffened him. He was a Jew, wasn't he? He held out his hands and watched the drops trinkle over his blackened knuckles, embarrassed thinking how the men in the cave would hoot if they could see him. The girl unwrapped the bundle and made three small piles, equal piles, he noticed, not skimping herself the way his mother used to do. Then Joe spoke a blessing and they handed Daniel his share, a few olives, a flat little loaf of wheat bread, and a small honey cake whose taste his tongue suddenly remembered from childhood. For the first time, Daniel felt his tight muscles begin to relax. His eyes met Joel's and the two boys studied each other without hostility. Why did you come up here? Joel asked wiping the last crumbs of cake off his chin. In some way, the food had made it easier to speak. I knew there were caves up here, Daniel answered. All I wanted was a place to hide where Elmelech couldn't catch me. But I couldn't find any caves, and I wandered around for three days, and then a man found me. He thought of how Rosh had found him lying flat on his face, starving, half-frozen, his back still raw from the flask flogging. He could, t how could he tell this boy what that night had been like? He remembered the terrible moment when he had seen the man bending over him and how Rosh had reached out a hand not to strike him but to help him to his feet. And then when he had flopped over, how Rosh had picked him up and carried him like a baby all the way to the cave. A robber? Joel questioned. A good man, said Daniel fiercely. He took me to live with him. What's it like up here? What do you do all the time? Hunt. Wolves and jackals, even panthers. Sometimes we hunt as far north as Mermont. Mer Miron. I work at my trade too. I made a forge to work on. Joel's looked impressed. Even the girl was listening with dark eyes as lively as her brother's. Daniel looked at the other boys with curiosity. He had been trying to find a distinguishing mark about Joel. What is your trade? he asked. I am still at school, said Joel. I'm going to go on to be a rabbi probably, but I studied sandal making too. I could earn my living at it, but I'm sorry for the man who has to wear my sandals. Daniel nodded. Of course, Joel would be a rabbi. He had always been the smartest boy in the school, but even a rabbi must learn a trade like any other man. Why did you come today, he asked. No one comes up here from the village. <coughs> Excuse me. The girl laughed. Well, be skinned alive if anyone finds out we've come, she said. We always plan to, Joel explained. Ever since we were children, we weren't allowed to because it's supposed to be dangerous. Today's a holiday and we just decided to come without telling anyone. It was our last chance. We're leaving the village and going to live in Cape Room. His sister frowned at him. I don't see why you always have to sound so dismal about it, she protested. I think Cape Room is going to be wonderful. <coughs> Excuse me. Joe's face looked suddenly closed. His fingers snapped the tops of his red blossoms one after another. It was plain to Daniel that this was an old argument between them. What more do you want, she demanded, forgetting Daniel in her instance. A big house to live in, shops and people, and a school with the best teachers in Galilee. Joe went on snipping the blossoms savagely. Father doesn't want to go, he said. He's only going to please Mother. Well, she answered, Mother left it all to please him once. He hasn't been e it hasn't been easy for her, living in Kazakh. Why shouldn't she go back? now that grandfather's left his house to her. It doesn't really matter to father where he is so long he has his books. 
Daniel listened. Shut out again from the clean, safe world that they shared. But all at once, his attention was diverted. Far down the mountain, on the narrow ribbon of road, he spotted a moving line that threw off reddish flashes of metal in the sunlight. At that sight, blackened hatred churned up in him. Out of habit, he spat violently. Pfft. The shock attention of the two jerked back to him, and they followed his savage gaze, leaning to peer at the moving line. Romans, snorted Joel. Daniel Lark liked the way he said the word. He spat again for good measure. Pfft. You hate them too, said Joel, his voice low. Daniel closed his teeth on a familiar oath. I curse the air they breathe, he muttered. I envied you, said Joe. Up here you're free. No one is free, said Daniel, so long as the land is cursed by the Romans. No, but at least you don't have to look at them. There's a fortress in Caper, and I have to watch them all the time, strutting around the streets. Oh, Joel, the girls protested. Do they have to bother us? bother us bother the boy's voice broke i shouldn't think even a girl could see of course i see she was stung almost to tears by her brother's content content contempt but what use is it to be always making yourself miserable the romans won't be there forever we know that deliverance will come you're talking like father but he's right. The Jews have been worse off before. There have always been conquerors, and there was always deliverance, Joel. Joel was not listening. He had caught Daniel's eye. And the two boys were studying each other, each asking a silent question. Melton sprang to her feet, recognizing well enough that this time is what she who was shut out. I'm not going to have my holiday spoiled by those soldiers, she said, with the trace of a childish pout. We've climbed all the way up here, and you scarcely looked at the things we can't came to see. Joel turned back to her good nature, naturally. We've seen something we didn't expect, she said. Daniel. She tossed her head. What about the places we used to talk about? The plain where Joshua marched out against the heathen king. Joe stands, shaded his eyes, taking his bearings. Just below them, the village clung to the rocky slope, the dark block of the synagogue showing clearly among the clustering flat-roofed houses. Around it circled a gray-green olive orchard and the fresh, clear green fields of grain, banded by purple iris and shining yellow daffodils. To the south lay the lake, intensely blue. To the north beyond the line of hills, though the shimmering misty green of the valley, the silver thread of the Jordan wound up to the shining little jewel that was the Lake of Mermon. Suddenly, bold, Daniel got to his feet. There, he pointed out, on that plain, Horses and chariots drawn up against him, and a great host of men like the sands of the shore. And Joshua fell on them and drove them as far as the great sea. He saw surprise on their faces. They thought he was an arrogant savage. The girl did it anyway. This was something he knew. Five years ago, that first morning, when he was warm and fed and slept out, Rosh had brought him up there and stood him <coughs> excuse me, with an arm across his shoulders and pointed to the plain in the distance and told him how a few brave men had dared to go out against the great army and how they had won a great victory for Israel. Up here in the clean sunlight, Daniel Barjamin, orphan, runaway slave, had found something to live for. All the mighty ones, he said, remembering Rosh's very words. Joshua, Gideon, David, all of them fought on the soil of Galilee. No one could stand against them. It will be so again. Yes, breathed Joe, 
It will be so again. God will send us another David. His eyes glistened as though he could, he too could see the shadow of the vast army moving on the distant plain. You mean the Messiah? Mathrace cried. Oh, Joe, do you remember? We always thought that up here we'd see him. I was sure, said Joel. I knew that if we could only climb up here, that would be the day he would come. I believed it so hard it seemed to me I could make it happen. So did I, and we could be the ones to rush down the mountain and tell them, and all the people in the village would drop their work and follow him. Do all the children have such wild imaginations? Joe was instantly sober. The Messiah is not imagination. It's the truth. It is promised. But straining our eyes at every cloud in the distance and thinking we would be the first ones. I still want to be, cried Joel, so passionately that the other two were startled. Call it childish if you like. That's why I don't want to go to Capram. But it may be years. No, it must be soon. <coughs> Excuse me. Not the way we imagined it. They see a... <clears throat> I used to think he could come with a great host of angels. Now I know it must be men, real men, trained and armed and ready. He checked himself. There are such men, said Daniel, keeping his eye on the distant hills. Without looking, he felt the other boy's muscles tighten. I know, Joel answered. Excitement leaped from one boy to the other. The questions had been answered. Malthus looked at her brother, puzzled by something she could not understand. We should start back now, she said. We must be home for supper. I'll walk away with you, Daniel offered. He was thinking that he would like to see them safely onto the main road. They started down the steep slope of the mountain. Once they felt the summit behind, the breeze died down, the golden sun hung close above them, and not a leaf moved beside the path. They did not talk now. Daniel could see the, that Joel was still seething with hidden thoughts. He suspected that for the girl, this holiday had not turned out as she had hoped. As for himself, he was ready already beginning to wish that they had never come. He had been satisfied up there, not thinking too much, shutting out the things he didn't want to remember, working for Rosh and waiting, nursing his hatred for the hour that would come. He had never had a friend of his own, and he had never thought about wanting one. What hadn't he let well enough alone? Malthus was impatient now. Probably her conscience was beginning to trouble her. But Joe lingered, trying deliberately to fall behind, when his sister was distracted by a clump of mirth blossom just ahead. He spoke half under his breath. There was something else I hoped for when I came up here, he said. I've heard that Rosh the outlaw lives on the mountain. I hope I might be lucky enough to see him. Why? He's a hero to every boy at school, but no one has ever seen him, have you? Daniel hesitated. Yes, he said. Joe stopped in the pathway, forgetting his caution. What I give, are the things they say about him true? What do they say? That he fought beside the great leader Judas when they rebelled against the Romans and Sephiroth and that when the others were crucified he escaped and hid in the hills. Some men say he's nothing but a bandit who robs even his fellow Jews, but others say he takes the money from the rich and gives it to the poor. Do you know him? What is he really like? No caution to the world could hide his fierce pride that rushed over Daniel. He's the bravest man in the world. Let them say what they like. Someday every man in Israel will know his name. Then it's true, cried Joel. He's raising an army to fight against Rome. That's what you meant up there, isn't it? And you, you are one of them. I knew it. Rosh is the man I told you about, the one who found me. I've been with him ever since. I envy you. I've dreamed of joining Rosh. 
Then come, no one could find you up here. Mathes had stopped and turned back, waiting. Joe looked down at her and made a small, helpless gesture. It's not so simple as all that, he said. My father. Oh, Joe, why are you so slow? What are you talking about? The girl stood in the pathway, her arms full of crimson blossoms, her dark hair still uncovered, falling about her shoulders, her cheeks flushed with the sun. If he were Joel, would run away? Daniel wondered suddenly. Suppose his father and mother waited with the lamps lighted and a good supper laid out. Suppose he had a sister who could run to the top of the mountain with him and be scarcely winded. Then abruptly he stopped wondering. Just below Mathes he caught sight of another figure. In the middle of the trail, blocking their way, stood one of Rosh's sentries, Elbow, waiting for them to come down. Well, that's chapter one of The Bronze Bow by Elizabeth Joyce Spear. I recommend you to read 30 minutes every day. You can get a copy of this book from Amazon or the li local library and follow with me. We'll read chapter two soon. Thank you. Please like, share, and subscribe to Miss Rose's Storytime. Good night.